Hello everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about the enantiomers and diastereomers. An important thing to remember is that enantiomers and diastereomers are the only stereochemical relationships between the stereoisomers. If two molecules have the same molecular formula and the same connectivity between the atoms, they are either enantiomers, diastereomers, or they are the same molecule. So don't say that the relationship is cis-trans, it's not a relationship. Neither is RS or EZ. Those are the descriptions or properties of individual molecules. The relationship is either enantiomers or diastereomers. So without any further ado, enantiomers. By definition, the enantiomers are the two molecules that are mere reflections of each other and are non-superimposable in space. So if I have two molecules, like let's say molecule A and B over here, those two molecules are both mirror images of each other and they're non-superimposable in space, which means that no matter how much I rotate one of the molecules in space, I will never be able to make it look exactly like the other one. On the other hand, the diastereomers, they're going to be neither mere reflections of each other, nor they're going to be superimposable in space. Which means that if I look at my molecules, let's say C and D over here, those two molecules, they are not mere images of each other, and they're not superimposable in space. Again, no matter how many times I rotate one of those molecules, I will never be able to make one into another one via simple rotations in space. And one other thing that I want to point out is that when you have a pair of enantiomers and you have the chiral atoms on those, so all R and S stereo descriptors, they will change between the molecules. So like in my molecule A, I have the stereo descriptors S and R for the corresponding atoms, they become R and S for the mere reflection. In the case of the diastereomers, I have S and R for my molecule on the left as well. However, in the case of the diastereomers, only some of the R and S stereo descriptors are going to change. So in this case, the stereo descriptor by the OH group, the S stereo descriptor stayed as is. However, my stereo descriptor uh, at the carbon next to bromine did change. So you can use that as a useful trick when you are determining whether your molecules are enantiomers or diastereomers by looking at the stereo configuration of the chiral atoms and assigning the stereo descriptors. If all of your descriptors flipped, that most likely you are going to have a pair of enantiomers. If only some of those flipped, then most likely you are going to have a pair of diastereomers. So I've been talking about the mirror images over and over again here, but what exactly are the mirror images and how we are going to make those mirror images. So let's say I have a molecule that looks like this. I have a five-membered ring and I have a bromine atom uh, sitting on one of my carbons. If I'm going to make a mirror image of this molecule, there are three different ways how I can do that. So one way is going to be by making a plane of mirror my vertical line. If I reflect the molecule over that line, I'm going to reflect it exactly like a, a wings of a butterfly or like an ink blot between the two pieces of paper. So what that means that my green reflection over here is going to look like this. Now bromine is still on the wedge, but now bromine is on the left side. I can also have a mirror plane being the horizontal line. If I have that as my mirror plane, then what I'm going to end up with as a, a mirror reflection is, again, flipping the molecule over that line, so I will have the double bond on top, then the rest of my molecule, and bromine is still on the right side, like this. On top of that, I can also have the paper itself being my mirror. So if paper itself is a mirror, then essentially it will look like two molecules are standing in front of each other. So in this case, I will end up with a molecule where my wedged line is now a dashed line like that. So you can use that as a very quick trick by essentially taking all of your uh, dashes, making them into wedges, taking all the wedges and making them into dashes. Or you can uh, use one of the other uh, mirroring techniques that I have just demonstrated. Let's do one more example. 
I now have a molecule, an open chain molecule, and I have a bromine atom over here, and I have an OH group in the middle like that. So again, if my plane of mirror is the vertical line like this, then what I'm going to see in my mirror is now bromine is going to be on the left side, the OH is still going to be in the middle. If my plane of mirror is the horizontal line, then what I'm going to see is the following. The bromine is now looking down and it is still on the wedge. The OH is looking kind of up and it is still on the dash. And if my plane of mirror is the page itself, then I'm essentially going to be drawing the same skeleton, but all of my dashes and wedges are going to be flipped. So bromine is now looking away from me and OH is looking at me like that. We can also confirm that we did the correct mirror reflection by uh, taking the RNS theory descriptor and assigning those RNS theory descriptors to our atoms. So the chiral atom that I have in my first molecule, that one is going to have the R stereo configuration, while the chiral carbon in my green mirror reflection, that one is going to have the S stereo configuration. The blue molecule will have the S stereo configuration, and the uh, light purple molecule, that one is also going to have the S stereo configuration. And remember that whenever we make a mirror image, all of our uh, R and S stereo configurations flip. Same deal I'm going to have in my other example. The carbon with bromine in my original molecule has the S stereo configuration. However, in my green reflection, that one is R. In my blue reflection, that is also R. And in my purple reflection, that is also R. The oxygen or the carbon next to oxygen in my original molecule is going to be R. In my green reflection, that's now going to be S. In my blue reflection, that is going to be S. And in my purple reflection, that is also going to be S. And of course, I do employ you to check that work on your own and copy those molecules, assign your RNS theory descriptors, just like we've talked about in one of my previous videos, and check that for yourself. Don't just trust my word on that. Now, what is the difference between the reflections and rotations in space. When I'm doing the rotations in space, I'm not actually creating a new molecule. I'm just taking the old molecule and I'm rotating it in space. Let me demonstrate. So I'm going to use exactly the same molecule as I had in the uh, previous example. So I will redraw it on my right side so you can see all the differences between my reflections and rotations. So I have my bromine atom and the stereo configuration of my uh, chiral atom is still R over here. So, just like with reflections, there are three different rotations that we can do. Rotation number one is going to be taking my molecule and rotating it in the plane of paper. So essentially as if you just took your screen and rotated it in space like a steering wheel of a car. Well, in this case, I'm going to end up with a molecule that looks like this, and I have my bromine now over here on the left side. To double check that I accidentally didn't make a mirror reflection, I can assign my stereo descriptor to my chiral atom, and here, if I do all the steps and I do it correctly, I'm going to end up with the R stereo configuration as well. All right, well, that was one rotation in space. How about I do rotation in space along the horizontal plane like that? So essentially, it's as if I am piercing my molecule with the long stick and rotating it uh, along this long stick like I'm barbecuing my molecule. In this case, I'm going to end up with a molecule that looks like this. Bromine is still on the right side, it is on the dash now, and again, if I were to assign my stereo descriptor to this atom, it is going to be the R stereo descriptor as well. And lastly, one other type of rotation that we can have is when we are taking our molecule and we are rotating it along the vertical axis like that. I like to call this rotation single ladies, you know, just like the dance. So if I do the single ladies, then what I'm going to end up with is a molecule that looks like this with my bromine on the 
left side and it's also going to be on the dash. If I were to assign the stereo descriptor to this chiral atom, again, that is going to be the R stereo descriptor. So these are going to be my rotations in space. So these two operations, reflections and rotations, are going to be probably the two most important type of operations that you are going to be doing with your molecules, especially when you are trying to compare those molecules and you are trying to uh, distinguish between enantiomers, the asteromers, same molecules, etc. So practice your reflections and rotations and use the R and S theory descriptor as a useful trick to double check your work. And here is a very common misconception. And the misconception is that enantiomers and diastereomers, they need to have chiral atoms. No, that is not true. The definition of enantiomers and diastereomers only specifies the three-dimensional relationship between the molecules, and it does not specify any of those molecules having chiral atoms. The definition of enantiomers is that they need to be non-superimposable mirror images, while the definition of diastereomers, they are non-superimposable non-mirror images. So anything that fits that definition will be the corresponding pair. Let me give you an example. So let's say I have two cyclohexanes, and those are substituted at the top position with, for instance, a bromine, and the OH position with, let's say, an OH group. So this is going to be my first molecule, I'm going to call it molecule A. The other one is going to have the uh, substituents also at the top with bromine looking at me, and OH at the bottom looking at me as well. I'm going to call that molecule B. So, when it comes to the relationship between our molecules A and B, well, they are not mere images. Are they superimposable in space? Upon close inspection, we can see that they are not superimposable in space either. So, by definition, that means that these two molecules are diastereomers. However, do we have any chiral carbons here? Absolutely not. If you think that this carbon with the bromine might be chiral, well, it is not, because the right and the left side of my molecules are the same. Same thing with the carbon with an OH. That carbon has the left and the right side of the molecule the same, so it doesn't have four different substituents. That means that we do not have any chiral atoms in these molecules, yet they are non-superimposable, non-mirror images, which by definition makes them diastereomers. Likewise, people think that, well, enantiomers, they gotta be chiral, so if the molecule is chiral, it's gotta have the uh, chiral atoms in it, right? Well, actually, no. Here is a classic example of alenes, molecules with two double bonds coming from the same carbon. In this case, these two molecules, they are mirror images, and they are non-superimposable in space, so by definition they are enantiomers. But do they have chiral carbons? No, they do not. In order to be a chiral, carbon needs to have four different substituents, and we do not have a single carbon in this molecule with four different groups around that. So remember, molecules don't need to have chiral atoms in order to be chiral. Likewise, molecules don't have to have chiral atoms to have enantiomers or diastereomers. The definition is the key here always go with the definition rather than the shortcut or the common example that you might have seen in your class, because those common examples don't necessarily describe every single possibility that you are going to have within the scope of your course. And by now you are probably rolling your eyes at me and thinking enantiomers, diastereomers, who cares? Well, nature does. So here is the deal. Enantiomers are physically and chemically indistinguishable in a non-chiral environment. A non-chiral environment is such an environment in which all other molecules are achiral or non-chiral. So, for instance, if you have an aqueous solution, let's say just a glass of water, that would be a non-chiral environment. So, in this non-chiral environment, enantiomers have same physical properties like melting point and boiling point and same reactivity. However, as soon as you put put an enantiomerically pure molecule into a chiral environment, like let's say your body. Our bodies are perfect example of chiral environment. Everything in our body cares very much about the stereochemistry. 
So inside of our bodies, different enantiomers can have very different chemical properties and can have very different reactivity. So if you want a good bedtime horror story, look up the history of thalidomide. One enantiomer of thalidomide is a drug that will alleviate the nausea, headaches, and a whole bunch of other very unpleasant sensations, while the other enantiomer is actually a very powerful mutagen and causes horrific birth defects. Just don't look it up while you're eating. Now, when it comes to diastereomers, they have different physical and often chemical properties, regardless of the environment they're in. This means that diastereomers can be easily separated using physical separation techniques such as chromatography, distillation, or crystallization technique. The only physical property that will distinguish two enantiomers is their optical activity. Optical activity is the property of the chiral molecule to twist the plane of polarized light either to the right or to the left, so this is how we can experimentally study those molecules. But other than that, in achiral environments, enantiomers are the same, diastereomers are pretty much always going to be different. Also, many reactions in chemistry are either going to produce stereochemistry or destroy stereochemistry, so we always need to keep a very keen eye on what's going to happen with our molecule and if the molecule all of a sudden obtains stereochemistry. If it does, we'll have to pay attention to that and indicate it in our products as well. Well, that's about it I have about the enantiomers and diastereomers. Thank you for watching this video till the very end. If you want practice questions on the stereochemical relationships to determine whether things are enantiomers or diastereomers, or want to learn about any other topics in organic chemistry, go check out organicchemistrytutor.com, hit the like button if you found this video helpful, drop your questions and feedback in the comments below, and I'll see you next time!